For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We are in a, a study that came off from a study. We were studying the stages of spiritual growth. We studied seven lessons on that. And then we are now in seven lessons on the characteristics of reaching spiritual maturity, stage four, and maintaining it to dying grace. We call that period of reaching and maintaining to dying grace super grace. It's based on 2 Thessalonians 1.3, where there is the word uh, in there for greater growth, which is hooper oxano, and that is a word for super growth. And that's where we get that, among other Greek words uh, that give us that. But that's the one we're dealing with. And we're in now 2 Corinthians 8, chapter, verse 7 where Paul uses one of those uh, spiritual maturity concept words in the word abound. He uses it twice, and he uses it in a significant way in the Greek language. In verse 7, he says, and we're looking at six characteristics of super grace status. That's spiritual maturity. One who has reached spiritual maturity and is maintaining that position or status into dying grace. You know, it is a choice. Once you get there, it's a choice. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, those five things work off from the first word, abound. Then he says... See that you abound, and he uses that word again, with the sixth characteristic, which is karos, grace. And so you want to identify the six characteristics of spiritual maturity in what we call super grace status, having reached and maintained spiritual maturity unto dying grace. And he says they are Faith, utterance, which is the word logos, it is the word word, but it's used as a word that's being taught or expressed or through speech, the word of God. So faith, utterance, knowledge, earnestness, love, and grace, gracious work, grace. And so on your paper, you have a, a little tree with six limbs. Pistas, faith, lagos, word, gnosis, knowledge, spute, earnestness or diligence, agape, love, and charis, grace. These are all important. And this, less, this extended study comes from our study of 1 Timothy 2.4 where it is God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And from that, I said, I need to do a study on spiritual growth because it's God's desire we get saved and spiritually grow. And so I felt like I should stop and tell you what that means. <laughs> and so it's extended into a pretty good study here. So let's open with a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. We are talking today about, this is part one of super grace knowledge, the word gnosis that's used in our 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2. You have the privilege and responsibility to confess sin if necessary in the Christian life, mental attitudes, sins, sins of the tongue, and avert sins should be confessed because the great teacher of the word of God is a Holy Spirit. You cannot learn the truth from the word of God. You cannot gain the wisdom of God from the flesh. 
you get it from the Holy Spirit. It's spiritual wisdom and knowledge. So God has provided for the believer through the extension of propitiation from the cross to the believer's life in confession of sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing is that extension from salvation to the Christian life. Dealing with sin, this time, sin that interferes with the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I give you a moment to do that before we start our study. We're thankful, Father, for all that your grace has provided us <clears throat> to be able to assemble in freedom. We pray for our nation today. Paul says we should pray for our national leaders down to the local level of government that we might live quiet and peaceful lives. We certainly are encouraged by that, Father, to pray for our, our nation and our leadership that we may have the peace to carry the gospel forth in our communities and our families in our nation without censorship. We are thankful that we've had this for so long because of your marvelous grace. You are faithful. We come tonight, Father, to talk about super grace knowledge. The connection between gnosis knowledge and epinosis knowledge is a key to learning. We pray the Holy Spirit would teach that to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Today what we're going to look at as is the third characteristic that Paul listed. He doesn't list them necessarily in order of importance. He lists them just as he wants the church at Corinth to understand them. He's writing to a local church such as we are. Things in this hour, tomorrow night I'll continue this study. This is part one. We read 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 7, and we saw that gnosis, or the word knowledge, was the third characteristic listed by Paul in this passage. And this was important to the Corinthian church. Now listen to me, because this is a letter this is important. What he said in verse 7 is important to the context of what he's talking about. And the context of this one little verse that I pulled out, 2 Corinthians 8, 7, the context is chapter 8 and 9. Now, hopefully, sometime before I get through this study in seven weeks, you will read that, those two chapters. I mean, it's not going to take you any time to do that. But you ought to read that. See the context. I mean, the context is everything. It is important to remind you that these are only, now listen to me now, this is important, that you don't get nutty with these six characteristics. These are not the only characteristics of super grace. These are the only ones that he listed that were actually to the Corinthian church. These are not the only characteristic of super grace, but only the ones that Paul felt important for a specific message, which is recorded in chapters 8 and 9. For example, when Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, when he was writing 1 Corinthians, Paul mentioned faith, hope, and love. And he said there that love was the greatest of these three. They're not the only three characteristics of super grace life. They were the three most important to the, to the, when he wrote to the same church in 1 Corinthians. Okay? We're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, love, and hope, and the grace of these is love. Now, if you pay any attention to the book, he's going to come back. If you pay any attention to the book and if you pay any attention to 1313, the context of the love message to this Corinthian church was in spiritual gifts, the function of spiritual gifts. Well, in 2 Corinthians 8th chapter and 9, he's talking about giving and he's talking about how you approach the concept of giving for the work of the Lord. 
But in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he's talking about spiritual chapters 12 in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 about spiritual gifts. And he uses love here uh, in a unique way in regard to that. And so he says love is the greatest within the context of what they were struggling with. Those three aren't the only characteristics that we've learned, but they're important in context. In the, de in the message he was delivering, these were very important, and love was the one he was after. So, what I'm saying to you, these six are not the only characteristics of super grace life, but they were the most important to Paul to get the message across of what was important. And if you read Paul, he does this. Even Peter does this. And we'll talk more as, as we go along. I'm just, just so you don't get the idea that there are only six characteristics, okay? There are a lot. And if you're going to look at them, you always look at them within context because then you can figure them out. That's key. Now, the second thing that I would want to remind you about is this word gnosis, knowledge, is what, to, and it's the, it's the elementary side of learning. It's the elementary side. Gnosis is the elementary side. If you don't get gnosis, you don't get nothing. Knowledge is shut down. You're as dumb as a brick. All right, there's no knowledge going on. Gnosis is the elementary principle. That's important that we understand that. Knowledge, gnosis, is what takes place in a person who is learning. There are many Greek words for knowledge. But none as important as learning than gnosis to epinosis. Now you can see the word gnosis, and when you go from gnosis to epinosis, you add a preposition. And that preposition means that gnosis is coming to its completed end or to fulfillment. That's what that means. Now, what I did is I drew the faith cycle to show you something. And there is a line, you know, the faith cycle is faith, believing, uh, applying, and completing. Hearing. The word faith cycle, there should be the word hearing. It's not on your paper. But right up there beneath the word faith, you should write the word hearing. Hearing. I didn't put it there. It should be hearing. It's Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's where it all begins. And that's where gnosis, that gnosis with positive volition picks up on it. Therefore, on the Listen to me now. On the hearing and believing side, see that line? Over there on the, the hearing and believing side, I want you to write the word gnosis. That's G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. It's on your paper, so it's right up there above the word faith cycle. Gnosis. G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. On the other side, applying and completing, I want you to write epinosis. Because now you can see how it works. The faith cycle works by you hearing the word of God and believing it. When it does, gnosis becomes epinosis in that phase. When it shifts over to the application and to the completion of it, it is epinosis. When gnosis moves you to epinosis, then faith reaches its cycle. When it does, there is a capacity now, a, a capacity for God, a capacity for life, a, a, a capacity for the Word of God, because you've seen the dynamics of it working. And so that's, that's gnosis, it takes you to epinosis. And in the faith cycle, it all begins with the Word of God, hearing, understanding, believing. That's the gnosis side. That's, you now have knowledge. Now it's time to apply that knowledge. When you apply that knowledge and wait on God to complete what he's promised you, like Romans 4.21, 
you now have epinosis. That two aspects results in learning. That's how you learn. Now, I want you to, before I go to point three, I want you to go back and take a good look at the diagram because this is how gnosis and epinosis work with the Word of God. Okay? You hear it. You understand it. You believe it. That's gnosis. When you get there, that's, osis, that's gnosis, and it's now pushing to epinosis. It has completed its task, and the next task for learning to, to, to go, you've got to apply what you've learned to understand its importance in your life. And when you do, it works because God says it will do it. That's Romans 4.21, right? You know, there is the, there's the promise side and there's the performance side. And epinosis would be that in the process of learning. Gnosis to epinosis. When that occurs, a learning cycle has happened and you're, you are advancing your capacity for whatever subject you're studying has expanded. You've gone from 101 to two, 200 to 300 to 400 if you know the educational system. Now, I want to show you something. I want to show you something important in the teaching of Jesus. I want you to go to Luke, the 11th chapter with me. I want to show you something. Because it is this that allows me to take a building metaphor. In Luke, the 11th chapter, in the 11th chapter, in about 37, if you have a study Bible, you see that we're in a new section of context. And verse 37, now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went to lunch with him. And verse 38, the Pharisee was surprised when uh, that Jesus had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. And he brings it up. It, apparently, the Lord responds to it. Now, that's important to this. He's, he's having lunch with Pharisees. You're going to go. With who? But down in, but what I'm after, and so this lunch goes on, and during this luncheon, he pronounces woes upon them, upon their the theology. He pronounces woes, W-O-E-S, woes on their theology. Now, in the midst of these woes, woe unto you. And he, he shows them their errancy of theology with these woes. In verse 52, in the last woe. You know, as a farm boy, when you said woe, the horses stopped. I think this is a different woe. Uh, but he says, woe to you, lawyers, the Pharisees, for you have taken away the key of Gnosis. There is a key of Gnosis. Gnosis is the key to learning the truth from the Word of God. I want you to get that. That's why you come to Bible study. That's why I come prepared to teach you Gnosis at Bible study and encourage you to take the Epinosis by faith. He said, Woe to you, lawyers. You have, that is, the promoters of the law, right? Lawyers, promoters of the law, teachers of the law. 
you have taken away the key of gnosis, that is the word knowledge, and did not enter in yourself, and those who were entering in you have hindered. It is this concept of a key, which, by the way, is used a lot with Jesus Christ, and I'll come do a study on it because it's magnificent, the word key that's connected to him. He's got a big keychain, and every key on that chain is important, and he has authority over it. And there's a wonderful study in that. But it is this idea of a key that unlocks a door that to have a building metaphor with my study on this gnosis key this key of knowledge of the word of God has been announced by Jesus in this famous passage on the woes at a luncheon I bet they said, boy, never serve him. That Whatever he ate, don't give that to him again. But they tried to feed him legalism, and he wasn't taking it. Right? It's well worth your reading. But I want to use this, the key of gnosis, in a building metaphor. The foundation of the building... You know, before a building goes up, we've got to have a foundation, right? All you engineers know that. The foundation is grace salvation by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us what the gospel is, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about Jesus fulfilling the word of God at the cross and in his resurrection. And that becomes the gospel that you believe that has the power to save you. Romans 1 16. And that power is connected to the benefits we receive for by grace, we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of our works. It is a gift not of our words, at least we would boast. When it comes to salvation, you can only boast of God did all the work and I, I got all the benefits. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Now the passage I want you to look at is on the bottom of your first page dealing with the foundation. This is where the idea comes from. You've got to have a foundation on which to build. Jesus said, not only do you have to have a foundation, it needs to be not on, on shifting sand, right? I'm not can't take it that far. I'm, I'm just thinking we got enough sense to build it. I grew up in a community, had a resort area right off, the lake, right off Lake Michigan. And we had sand dunes based on wind wind and sand you know you don't get dunes without wind people from chicago as a rule would come up people that had more money than we had money would come up and build homes and they wouldn't listen to the locals we weren't smart but listen we saw this the wind shift every year we, we, we saw the sand shift with the winds every year. We weren't as smart as the people from Chicago. Well, we knew that when the winds blew, wherever you built a house was all going to change. And they would come out and they would build them on shifting sand. And the house would be gone next year when they would come for vacation. Half of it would be in the water and the other half would be land. It was just a matter of time. So, but there has to be a good foundation, but it has to have, it has to be put on the proper land, doesn't it? Well, that's not my study, but my study is the foundation. Think, knowing that we got enough sense to put it to the right place. The foundation is grace salvation. Now listen, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, 
the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. And he's talking about salvation. The Lord knows those who are his and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. The firm foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, the firm foundation of God stands. See that word stand? It's the word histomy, but that's not what's important. The what's important, it's a perfect tense. In the Greek language, a perfect tense, this is a perfect active indicative. The perfect tense means completed in the past or where the result is stands completed forever. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead or de death, the foundation was established. Whoever's in that foundation is in the perfect tense of that foundation. Perfect tense. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you are in the perfect tense of a firm foundation. You are in stage one of, of spiritual growth. <laughs> Listen, not only that, but it has a seal on it. You know, like a good housekeeping seal. You know, except this is good salvation. It has a seal. It has a, this firm foundation has the seal. And on that seal is written this, for how long? F forever, perfect tense. Listen, the firm foundation stands forever. There's not going to be another point of salvation for you. That point of salvation is Calvary or Golgotha where Jesus Christ died then was buried and raised from the dead. That is the point of the foundation that is forever. That's forever. Therefore, when you believe that, you become part of this foundation. That foundation is eternal life. You have permanent eternal there's not going to be another Savior is not going to come in and die on a cross and be buried and raised by it. When Christ comes back, he's going to be riding a big horse, right, and carrying a big stick. Right? Everything's going to be big. He ain't going to ride no little mule in. So we need to understand that. Listen, and it has this seal. On that seal it says, the Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. The second, I see the foundation, that's part of a metaphor. The second part of the metaphor connected with Jesus Christ is he's the door. He's the door. The door for, for the key, you see, the door, he's the door for the key. The door for the key is spiritually learning of the word of God, from the word of God that, of Jesus Christ. He is the door, he is the door that the key fits. The key of knowledge fits. He is the door. In John... If you'll go to John with me, I'm in Luke, so let's f flip over here to John, the 10th chapter. You're familiar with this, that he is the door. John, the 10th chapter. And we pick this up in verse 6, which he says this is an allegory or a figure of speech. In verse 6, he says, the figure of speech Jesus spoke, this figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said, truly, truly, point of doctrine, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Then he goes on. 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And what my lesson is about is the abundant life. You're not going to get into the abundant life without going through the four stages of growth. And if you really want to know why your feet are on earth and your mind is in heaven where it ought to be, feet on earth, mind in heaven, right? Colossians, the third chapter. If that's the way you should live and that's the way you should live, then you're going to discover what the abundant life is all about before you die and go to heaven. Your abundant life is going to come through your relationship with God and his word. You're going to go through stage one, two, three, and four, and you're going to enter into the enormous abundant life before you ever get to heaven. The abundant life. The abundant life. You see, the world talks about it. They don't have a clue. They think it's all about things, temporal things. It's all about temporal things. It's, it's all about something that can rust, be stole, or blow away, or, or uh, somebody come along and say, you didn't pay me enough and take it from you. That's not what, that's the amount of the abundant life I'm talking about. I'm talking about the abundant life that can never be taken by you. There is nothing in this world can take it from you. Nothing. That's what I'm talking about. And it's called abundant. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. I am the door. I am the door. He said, this is a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. In this case, in the Greek, they call it an allegory, but a metaphor. Knowledge in learning requires gnosis to epinosis. You've got to acquire some knowledge. And then you've got to apply it. And when you do, a learning experience goes on. You're taught how to saw a log by measurements. And you've got to learn what an eighth and a quarter and all that is. Because when you cut it and you don't know that, and you take it back to the guy who's pounding it up, he ain't going to like that when you go through a bunch of his lumber that he can't use. Right? And so you may have a job if you don't do it right, but you, sh you, 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 he may give you another chance, but he's not going to give you too many before you're off the job. Right? But once you learn that, you've gone from gnosis to epinosis when you go out there and with confidence cut that board, give it to him, and it'll fit. If he gave me the right measurement, that'll fit. And if he didn't, then it's on you. Right? See, that's gnosis to epinosis. When you are able to do that, then you're confident. You can give me any measurement on this tape. I can cut that piece of board for you, Bubba. And if you'll pay me for doing that, we're both going to have, we're, this is going to be a good thing. That's gnosis to epinosis. That's learning on a specific area. These two are linked. They're very important. Same with cooking, same with housekeeping, you name it. This applies across the board in learning. Knowledge for learning is gnosis to epinosis of the word of God. It is the key for the spiritual building upon the foundation of salvation. Paul deals with this in, in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. He uses this analogy again in spiritual growth. Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 10, it just a figure of speech. According to the grace of God which was given to you, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident, yada, yada. See, he used a building analogy, didn't he? He built in there, and he said, here's the foundation. It is Jesus Christ. And how you build your Christian life in the word of God is important. 
how you build it, who you, who you get your materials from to build the house is very important. Tell you, you have no idea, and that's okay. <laughs> it's not your, it's not, it's not for you to stay awake at night and worry about. But let me tell you, for me, being sure that I got my ducks in a row when I bring it to you weighs heavy on me. I mean, a lot of nights I get back up, go back down. Take another look at it. Wrestle it out. So that you can come be fed. That I can go home and sleep knowing that I've done the very best I could do. That I've cut. Listen, I cut the measurements he gave me and I was confident I cut them well. Otherwise, I don't sleep good. Now, I didn't learn that in seminary. I learned that from the Holy Spirit who taught me the responsibility I have as a pastor teacher. But knowledge, listen, I got this according to the grace of God which was given to me as a master wise builder. I haven't always been a master wise builder, but I've always been a builder. But being a master wise builder is a kudos. And that's what I, I strive for. I don't strive just to be a builder. I strive to be a master wise builder. And hopefully all young men that come through here will be aspire to be master wise builders. Stage one and two. Spiritual growth, the newborn baby, the breath, and the early childhood development, which is an apios in the Greek language. Stage one and two are the first two floors. Here's the foundation, a wise master builder uh, helping you build your Christian life. The first two floors is spiritual growth. All four floors are spiritual growth, in my analogy. Stage one and two are the first two floors of spiritual growth. It's the brethos, the newborn baby of 1 Peter 2.2, and the napios of Hebrews 5.12. Now, we've studied all that. So, you know, if you're, if you're not up on it, well, you can go back and pick up the, the lessons. There are seven of them on spiritual growth called stages of spiritual growth that you can go back and study, and you, sh you should well do that. You can't start on a third floor without a first and second, right? <laughs> so this building's going up, and it, it goes in a process, but gnosis to epinosis is important in every process. In every stage of growth, th this element of learning has to, has to be there. Point number four, when knowledge goes from gnosis to epinosis, it develops the capacity to advance knowledge within a specific subject. So I want to take learning a language, okay? Because some of you have gone through our Greek course, and you've done something you never believed you could do. You've actually learned a Greek language. For some people, they catch it a little quicker than other people, but everybody can catch it. You just have to apply yourself. But if you, there's a process, stage one, two, three, and four, for learning. So I want to show you how you do this with a language. The first thing is alphabet to vocabulary. The first thing that has to be learned in a language is alphabet, even the English language. If you don't learn the alphabet, you can't get vocabulary, you can't get into words and structure. The alphabet is the ABCs, the elementary. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse one, 
they use the word elementary or ABCs is the idea. The alphabet is the starting place for learning a language. It is the starting place. As soon as a child is able to point to the correct letters, now listen, I don't know about other people's kids. I only know about my own and my own grandkids. But I've got a little grandson who in November turned two. November the 5th, he turned two. While they were home for Christmas this year, he went through the complete alphabet with me from A to Z. I, I was impressed with that idea. So I wrote them all out. I figured, you know, anybody, you know, I remember the song, A, you're adorable, B, you are beautiful, C, you're a cute, you know, I, we can, we can, it may not have any meaning. So I wrote the alphabet out, and I said, to, and I just pointed to something over here like a P, and I said, what is that? And he said, P. And so I went over here, and I pointed over there, and I said, what is that? And he went, E. He knew the alphabet by letters. Okay. Now, I went, you know what? He went from gnosis to epinosis in the alphabet. Do you understand what I just said? You understand what I just said? Yeah. So now he's ready to go to words. He's ready to go to words. Are you with me? He's ready to go to vocabulary. He is now ready to go to vocabulary. So, after a child has mastered this phase of alphabet, that he, not that he can just memorize them, but he can actually identify them. All the letters he can identify. He's gone from gnosis to epinosis. He's now ready to go to vocabulary and words. So, I said to him, I gave him some time to play, right? I mean, he's two. He'll tell you, I'm done. <laughs> right? And he could be most anywhere. And when he's done, he's done. And that's, that's okay. He's two. If he's 22, I got a problem, but he's two. Now, when I was able to get him back to Grandpa's side, I went up and I said, Pull me, pull me, point to me, B. He did. I wrote it. I wrote a line. I wrote a line. And then I looped it. I said, what is that? He said, B. I did it with an E and I did it with an N. I said to him, do you know what that is? And he knew that because Angie had worked with him. He went, Ben. I said, very good. He's got a word. He knows it. All right. Now I was able to take him, listen, words he's familiar with. Whatever words are coming out of his mouth, I need to visualize. Right? So I went to mom. I said, pull down an M, you know, pull, oh no, another M. That's mom. Point to mom. And so we went through several words that <coughs> he was already speaking. All right? <clears throat> when he's able to do that, tomorrow, when he can do that tomorrow and the next day, <clears throat> we've gone from gnosis to epinosis from alphabet to vocabulary to words. Now it's a matter of listening to his vocabulary, listening to words association so he can vis visualize them and we're into, we're into, we're, we're, we're pushing pretty good here. Do you understand that? Now this is a mother that spends a lot of time with her child as you can understand. She don't have four kids hanging off her. This little kid is on, on the move. Okay? What has happened is he's gone, and each time he's gone, and when he masters it, he, 
when he's, quote, mastered it, it's because he's gone from gnosis to epinosis. And a learning, he's in a learning curve. Do you understand that? Now we're able, we're able to move it, uh, through, he's debil developing capacity. Do you see the learning capacity? Same is true with learning the word of God. He, he has the learning capacity. The key to knowledge is advancing. The key to knowledge, talking about the key to the door, the key to knowledge is, is advancing from gnosis to epinosis. By developing the capacity to advance from uh, preliminaries into advanced thinking on a specific subject. Now, this is only one subject, you understand? But he's only two. After developing the elementary capacity of language, we are able to advance to grammar and sentence structure. All right? Now, they had to go home before I could get there. All right? But I may not get there for another couple years. Do you understand? I can be patient with it because he's already ahead of the curve. He's already ahead of the game, in my opinion. I mean, I was like six, not two, when I was there. It just proves that you can, you can play catch-up. Once we get to words, we can go to grammar. Once we go to grammar, we can go to sentences. Once we go to sentences, we can go to paragraph. We can go to writing. We can go to teaching the language. But every step of the way, it's building the capacity. And every time it's building the capacity, gnosis is working with epinosis, even though you're advancing in what's being assimilated. Agreed? I wanted you to be able to see that. I was amazed as I watched this little child develop this way. It is the principle. You see, human IQ and spiritual IQ work the same system, but a different source of function. To get there spiritually, you've got to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit because when you get to epinosis, what the Father wants to give you is divine wisdom and truth. When you get there from a human level, then you've got worldly wisdom. Do you understand that? You have worldly wisdom. It's the same system, but a different source. When it's the flesh doing it, it gets worldly wisdom. It gets worldly wisdom. You can get a doctorate degree doing this. A doctorate degree of Shaguanga Ganga. Okay? The same principle works over here in the spiritual realm under the ministry of the Holy Spirit because he wants to take you to a different place than just having knowledge. He wants to take you into divine wisdom and truth. Let me show it to you. Let me show it. I, I'm in 1 Corinthians. I don't know if this is on your paper at all. I don't see it on mine. So, But I, I want to... In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter and the second chapter, Paul deals with the Corinthians on this subject. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, this is what Paul talks about. For example, he talks about worldly wisdom versus divine wisdom. In verse 18, he talks about the word of the cross. is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1.18. Now, at lunch, where we were with Jesus today at lunch in Luke 11, he was with people with doctorates of theology who didn't have enough spiritual sense to come out of the rain. They would have drowned in the flood. They would have never got on the boat. They were in a state of perishing. They could get human wisdom, and they could go through the best of schools and get the degrees but they wound up with human, worldly knowledge, not applicable to, to divine wisdom. You can't apply any of that to divine wisdom. You cannot learn the Word of God that takes you, the Word of God that takes you into divine wisdom and truth in the flesh. Look at, in, verse, in the second chapter, 
Paul gets into, begins to do this in the second chapter. In verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. You see, while both systems works off from epinosis and gnosis, they go different directions. It is the same human system, works different directions. Please say, please tell me you see this. If not, you read this till your eyes fall back in your head. You need to know the difference of this in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Then he goes on. In verse 10, he says, chapter 2, For to us God revealed them the word of God, discussed prior to it, like verse 9, through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men know the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no man knows except the Spirit of God. See, you can't get that in human IQ. You can only get that in spiritual IQ. You, you have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to deal with this kind of stuff. But if you will, you listen, there, there is unlimited possibilities for you to understand the things of God. I mean the, the depths, the deep things of God. That's where my soul just hungers. My soul just hungers for that. Even so, the thoughts of God no man knows except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, Holy Spirit, who is from God, that we might know the things freely or grace given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Holy Spirit combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. See the process? I just did it with Ben. The Holy Spirit just did it with me. A natural man, that is an unbeliever, one without the Holy Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The flesh can't get it. But he was spiritual, appraised all things, and then he goes on to a discussion. See, this is very, very important that you understand this. The mechanism is the same. The direction and the flow of it and the source of it is completely opposite. You understand? But you see, you can learn by observation. I watched this whole thing work in little Ben's life. I saw gnosis and epinosis, and I understood that from a spiritual level, and I understood how to take him as far as his little heart wanted to go, that he had the time and didn't get bored. But you see, at his best, that's just human wisdom. But you see, I understood it from a spiritual standpoint. I didn't go to school to learn that. I learned it from the Word of God. I didn't have to go through child psychology. I learned it from the Word of God. I learned it from the Word of God. So, in this whole discussion, you see, what in Hebrews, the, the fifth chapter, verse 12, where Paul wants to get us in the word of God is to become teachers of it, to be able to speak it out to others with absolute truth and confidence. If you, if you stay here with me a year, I'll build that in you. I'll show you how I understand how it works in your life. And if you'll just come and be a good student, just like a person on the job, Frank, that goes out and the guy said, look, I'm going to be patient with that. I'm going to teach you this today. If you get it today, you got a job tomorrow. And if you don't get it today, this is not the place to work. Okay? You got to put, you, you, listen, you're not going to learn in here if you think it's all, it, it's a, Listen, if you get this attitude, well, I'm not smart as this, and I, I don't know this, and I don't know that, and I haven't been schooled here. I, listen, are you saved? <laughs> listen to me. Are you saved? Are you saved? If you know you're saved, you know, so clap your hands. If you know you <laughs> <laughs> So, see. Yeah, sure. See, if you know you're saved, listen. It's not dependent on your ability. It's dependent on you surrendering your inability to his ability. 
He's always equal to the task. You can learn as much as you want to learn. Now, you may not want to learn it, and that's okay. You may not want to learn the Greek language. You may not want to listen, but you ought to want to learn the Word of God. And we'll certainly teach it to you. There are certain things you have to know about how it works, though. And that's why I'm here. Now, in 2 Corinthians, at the very bottom of your paper, I want to close. I want to show you something in the dynamics of this verse. This is just one verse now. I pull this out. The context is chapters 8 and 9. But I put in bold print, you see the words, but just as? I want you to slide down. Do you see the word see that? They'll go, they'll go, they go together. Because but as, but just as, is, is Allah plus Hosper, that's an intensive comparative particle. <laughs> okay? But it's setting you up just as, what? Say, just as, but just as, See, so you have to keep going till it goes like, see that. Now watch. Just as you abound in everything, that's in plus the locative. This is important because there is no in. Now it's in your, it's in the English, but there's no, because it's understood that it's with the locative. But there's no end in faith, no in in utterance or knowledge or, or all earnestness or love. In everything covers all of those. Now, in the English, to show you that, they put the word in in it. In faith, in now, right? In your Bible, they did that. But in the Greek language, which is not there, it's carried by the locative, the preposition, the locative carries it all the way until there's a, something else shows you, until there's another trailer hitch. So that's important. Now look down at the bottom after you see the word, see that you abound, see just as you abound. Then he goes through five things. Then he says, see that? See, the just as is goes with the see, you abound, and he opens up another idea in this, and he comes back to the locative, in plus the locative, and he puts grace. Because his great emphasis in chapter 8 and 9 is going to be grace. Like, like in 1 Corinthians, it was love. That's just how you do it. And that is so good. So that's it today. And tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we're coming back to this subject matter. And we're going to look at this and how this idea of gnosis to epinosis works in our Christian life.